Hi, Greg Perry, the antiquarian horologist, uh, back with another wall clock. Um, at a previous episode, you would have seen us talking about a tavern clock or act of parliament clock. And I want to add something um, to that last video. And, and if not, you'll, you'll see the box on this video. Click that and you go back to the, the tavern clock video. Um, why called an act of parliament clock? And I believe in 1786, um, just like what was happening here in the States with the, with the glass tax. So as, as you know, in America, uh, the number of panes, the number of square inches of glass you had, you were taxed by the British government. So that's why a lot of houses didn't have a lot of windows. So, uh, so what was happening, the British government's wising up and saying, oh, this new phenomenon, clocks, 1770, 1785, they start pushing it through Parliament. It took two years. By 1786, 1787, they put a clock tax, and they called it the Act of Parliament to get that tax through because the people were raging against it. Everybody was getting a clock, and now you're taxing us. So it was a huge, huge uproar, but nevertheless, that's how the that clock was kind of in its, in its pinnacle, its acme at the time, the, the tavern clock. And it was used as an example. It was used as an example in Parliament because one stood way up in the top of the rafters and it got coined the Act of Parliament clock. So that's how we do that. But anyway, so we're back to this wall clock. So we have an eight-day clock here. And this is, you know, kind of similar to that Act of Parliament clock, the tavern clock, but refined, okay? We're in the mahogany age now, you know, 1750s to 18, 1820. Um, Big round dial, but not only that, we have a nice glass, uh, you know, we have a nice piece of glass here. We have a brass bezel and, um, you know, just the, not the name of the hoop guy who made it, but the name of the place it's from, Sheffield. The ultimate place for finding metal in the world, Sheffield, England. The best deal for chisels, carving tools, and hor horological tools. Um, as you can see, quite the basic dial, Roman numerals, uh, no half hour markers, and just the minute markers. So where would you find this? Called a gallery clock. So when, you, when in Britain, when you would walk into um, a large department store, um, something we might actually call a mall today, it would have been a big building with several small stores. That was the gallery, that initial walk-in, that foyer, that foyer was the gallery. And they usually were vaulted, or this was put in a bank too. So you'd walk in the gallery or the foyer of the bank, and this type of clock would have been there to tell the time. So hence it named gallery clock. Uh, anywhere from, again, 20 inch, 20 inch dials to maybe 36 inch dials. This is a, this is a quote, midsize, time only. Um, but these would have been very accurate because people coming in would have known. They could just pop in. Uh, they're going home for work. They're going to work. You know, they pop their head in the door. They look around. Oh, okay. I've got, you know, two minutes to get to work a block down the street or 15 minutes to go. So it would have been very good for the English to uh, do that. So they wanted to be very accurate. Not like the tavern clock, which it actually started in, in 1710, 1715. Accuracy didn't have to be that much. You knew a coach was coming in the next half hour or hour. Um, this is what we're getting at here, this is driven by a fusee. So, so we have really good timekeeping here. This is a chain-driven fusee, really high-grade movement. Um, this movement has eight-inch plates behind here. It's a tank of a movement in a pretty obscure uh, case here. Um, so you're seeing, you know, something probably the 1780s to 1798 with this, this type of bracket, this carved bracket. Um, I've had some people ask about this. The window is at right, so we see the pendulum going. And the bottom line is, there is no pendulum going. I have an extra mirror I cut, <clears throat> just in case that was to break. Um, the pendulum is, is not very long. It's about nine inch. It's sitting right about here. So there is no pendulum to see. So yes, it was glass. So it re would reflect back into the room. But again, these were put up about 15 feet, not the 20 plus feet that the other uh, tavern or act of parliament clocks were put. Um, but beautiful, be beautiful mahogany. Um, obviously, this has been redone. And kind of the interesting thing about this, um, you know, this dial comes off in the same way. Uh, we have a little bit limited light here, but there's two pegs here and two pegs there. So to get access, uh, and we also have an access door up here on this side, and uh, possibly the fusée uh, chain and the drum can be seen on the top. 
So the same thing, when this movement needs to be serviced, the standard procedure is to take the hands off, open the bezel, take the hands off, pull the four, four, four pegs out, take the dial off, and you see the movement with the pendulum hanging. And uh, you could service the movement or just do a quick lubrication of the movement there, and, and that's it. But the interesting thing about this is how they made the dial in this beautiful, beautiful mahogany, uh, the South American mahogany, and it's done in staves. It's done in pieces, okay? It's done in pieces. So how would they do that? They would glue these up. They would spline these. These are all splines. They're coming apart now. I mean, this clock has been around for 250 years, but they're all splined. So how would they create it? So they had a round molding plane. I'm sure everyone's familiar with the round molding planes to create the upper lip and the inner lip uh, when needed of barrels. So you would have had a similar one, but make the cutter to the profile that you need and zip around there. And sometimes you may have to do a, use a scraper, create an old blade to make a scraper to do a final, um, you know, just a final cleanup on this. So uh, the issue is, you know, as with everything over time, wood related, everything dries out and shrinks, but it gives a character and it gives it patina. So we have a, a lovely patina, <laughs> excuse me, before me, it was a refurbished style. So just a good, solid example of a mid-range gallery clock. Greg Perry, the antiquarian horologist, uh, thanks everyone for viewing in.